Good job, guys. Wow, y'all look good, too. Stay on the robes, looking good. Amen. Thank you, guys. Um, beautiful song. I'm glad I didn't have to sing it. Amen. You hear that high note they hit, that one? I just, that sounded like an old bullfrog trying to sing or something like that. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis uh, chapter 39. That's where we're going to be at this morning. If you have your chronological Bibles, that's page 54. And, and so just turn to page 54, Genesis chapter 39. Uh, the sermon title for this morning is, What Do You Do When Nothing Seems to Make Sense? And when, when nothing seems, I didn't say when nothing makes sense, but when it doesn't seem to make sense. There's this old story, and it's a good one. There's this... Uh, uh, this uh, brick layer, a brick mason, if you will, and he had too many bricks on top of this building, and he decided he needed to get these bricks down. And um, so he uh, kind of went up there and he uh, to retrieve his bricks. He went up to the third or fourth story there, and he put a yard arm out and attached a pulley to it and a rope and tied a rope and all that. And, and he, he got this big barrel, and he got it up there, and, and he loaded it with bricks. Now, he after he loaded it with bricks, and he came down, and he... And he got the rope, and he's ready to try to hoist this back down to the ground. It was at this moment that he realized that a barrel full of bricks is heavier than a man. Amen? So the bricks come down, the man goes flying up. Right? And he said that he, you know, he kept his uh, presence of mind. He didn't let go of the rope. Amen? Halfway up, he meets the barrel. The barrel hits him. Bam! And they hit. Ow, and that hurt. And he keeps going up to the top, and he gets his finger jammed literally in the pulley. Right? And he's up there. Well, the brick hits the ground. I mean, the brick, the, the, the barrel hits the ground. The bottom of, of part of the barrel just breaks loose, and all the bricks fall out. And so now the man is heavier than the barrel. So down, down comes the man, up comes the barrel. He meets the barrel halfway again. Bam! All right, and he lands on the ground on top of these bricks. Boom! He's laid out. He said, finally, I realize I need to let go of the rope. So he let go of the rope. The barrel falls and hits him in the head. Amen? <laughs> now, first of all... <laughs> couple things about this guy his problem is easy to figure out but I, I think sometimes we're like that right we're up and down and, and and we're doing good and we're doing bad and hard times come we feel like we're getting hit from every side but like I said this guy you kind of figure out his problem number one he wasn't very bright amen didn't know much about physics <laughs> or anything like that and his problem was his own problem he kind of created his own problem there didn't he but what do you do when you have a problem and it's not your fault, right? You're in some kind of darkness, some kind of situation, and you did nothing wrong. You, did, you don't deserve to be here. What do you do then when life does not seem to make sense? What do we do? And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. I, I, you know, people say things like, what, uh, when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. Well, that just blesses your heart, don't it? Amen. Or grin and bear it. Hmm. Right? Or don't, don't worry. Hey, things could always be worse and than they usually are. Right? I mean, that just blesses you so much. Well, I want to take, take a few minutes this morning and look here in chapter 39 of Genesis, and we'll be in chapter 40 as well. But I want to look at this life of Joseph, this man of God who uh, with, uh, loved God with all of his heart and despite of being in terrible, difficult Horrible situations. And, he, and he's been, you know the story of Joseph. He's been sold into slavery by his brothers. He's carried down by a caravan into Egypt. He's sold as a slave to a man named Potiphar. And, and there he's a slave in Potiphar's house. And, and then eventually this is what happens. Look at Genesis 39. We're going to look at verse 20 and through 21a. It says, and it's referring to Potiphar. Potiphar had him thrown into prison where the king's prisoners were confined. So Joseph was there in prison, but the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. There, he's, there he is in prison, but the Bible says that he, the Lord was with Joseph. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for uh, just the symbolism of your salvation that we had this morning, these, these baptisms. God, thank you for that. And Father, we pray that um, just as you were with Joseph in the prison, God, that you'll be with us here this morning. We love you. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I want to give you a few principles here this morning. If you've got your, uh, your bulletin, uh, just pull out your inserts out of your bulletin, take some notes this morning, and kind of follow along. But I'm going to give you some principles, these five principles, to practice the presence of God, even when it seems like he is nowhere around. He's not even close. Now, Joseph, again, he's a slave. 
It just doesn't get much worse than that. He's bought by Potiphar. And if you read the story, if you've been doing your, doing your Bible reading this week, you'll know uh, that um, he's in Potiphar's house, but he is such a man of industry, even as a slave to Potiphar, he's such a man of integrity that he rises through the ranks in Potiphar's house. Next thing you know, uh, Joseph is in charge of everything. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Potiphar said um, that the only thing he had to worry about was what, the, what was on his plate in front of him. That's all Potiphar worried about. He didn't concern himself with anything. Joseph was in charge and, and doing good. And everything's going great. And everything's going good for Joseph. But Joseph, unfortunately, like so many of us men here this morning, he was handsome. You know, it's, you know, it's just the girls laughing. Amen. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, Alicia loves me. And, and so, but here's the thing. No, seriously, Joseph is young and he's handsome, the Bible tells us. And he's a good-looking boy and the Bible don't lie. And, and so he's a handsome fella. And then Potiphar's got this wife, and she's lusting after Joseph, and she tries to seduce him, and Joseph says, no, thank you. And then she tried so hard, she grabbed him by his coat and, and tried to drag him into the bedroom, and, and Joseph took off so fast he left his coat behind. Right? He escaped. He fled. I think it was uh, I tried, Victor Hugo was the original person who said this, but hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Amen? I just want to see how many men would amen that. All right. So, but but he, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. She look. She is so insulted. She is so embarrassed by being rejected that she decides I'm gonna get even. And she began to scream and yell. And I just you know he assaulted me. And, and then I just think I think she messed up her hair, right? I think she just real quick just messed up her hair. Maybe she tore her clothes a little bit. Right, maybe she just scratched her own face, right? And, and whatever she, whatever the case, and the servants come in, and she's like, "This, this young, this young man tried, did this thing to me. He tried to molest me. He attacked me, right?" And so when Potiphar gets home, it's reported to him, and he has Joseph cast into prison, and that's how he ends up there. He's in prison. He's innocent. He's been serving God. He hasn't done anything wrong. As a matter of fact, he did the right thing, and now he's in prison. So I want to look at this and just pull some principles out of that, what we should do when we don't seem to understand what's going on in our lives. Number one, write this down. Take a notes. Write this down. First thing we have to know is don't demand to understand. Stick with me. Don't demand to understand. Now, you can, you know, try to understand. You should. You're going through a hard time. Try to understand. What's God teaching me in this? What's the point? What's going on? Try to understand, but don't demand to understand. Joseph had not sinned against God. Again, Joseph had done absolutely nothing wrong. And, and, and Joseph was doing right. And I imagine at this time that, that Joseph is being thrown into prison. He's completely innocent. He's being lied about, falsely accused, and everything is going wrong. And then Satan whispers in his ear, where's your God now? Where's God? What good did it do for you serving that God of yours? Look, this is what you get. First you get sold into slavery, and then you end up in Potiphar's house, and now you're in prison. Where is your God? Where is your God at? And there's going to come times in your life, if not already, it will. There's going to come times where things just don't make sense. Amen? They just don't add up. Why is this happening to me? I didn't do anything. I didn't ask for this. And I thought about this as, as I was reading through our Scripture reading here for this week. And I thought about this verse, and it's a verse we look at several times because it's, it's just packed full of godly wisdom. Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not rely on your own understanding. Think about him in all your ways, and he will guide you on the right paths. It says, do not rely on your own understanding. In other words, because you're confused, it doesn't mean that God is. Just because the situation doesn't, isn't working for you, it doesn't mean that God's not working it out for good. There are going to be times where we simply do not understand. Why? Why is this happening to me? Right? Don't demand to understand. Look at this verse in Isaiah 50, chapter 10. The prophet Isaiah asked this question, and it's a, it's a really, really good question. He says, Who among you fears the Lord, listening to the voice of his servant? Who among you walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of Yahweh. Let him lean on his God. 
And what's this verse? It teaches that, listen, you can be serving God. You can be doing the right things. You can be working through this and still come to a time of darkness, a time of confusion where you don't understand, and yet you have done nothing wrong. And see, don't get the distorted idea that the Christian life is nothing but, I don't know, you know, ice cream and pumpkin pie. I don't know. They're trying to, it, it, it's just easy, and, and nothing's ever going to go wrong. I think sometimes when, when you hear people and invite people to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, sometimes we kind of give them this distorted view of the Christian life that, you know, it, you're, in, in your youth, you're going to win all your victories, that you're, nothing's ever going to go wrong for you, and that you're going to live to a ripe old age with a happy family life, and you're just going to kind of fade into heaven. And many, many times it happens like that. And many, many times it doesn't. And that's just not what life, and God never promises this kind of perfect, happy existence. It doesn't happen that way. And as you study the Bible, if you read Scripture, you'll find time and time again that servants of God, were, they come to this point of, what's going on? Why is this happening? How did I end up here? God, where are you when we need you? I think about Job, one of the greatest characters in the Old Testament. Right? He lived in a time of darkness for sure, and he was confused, and he couldn't understand. As a matter of fact, he wanted to argue with God. And as a matter of fact, he kind of demanded to understand what was wrong. Job got so caught up in his own righteousness. You know, God, are you, how could you do this to me? Right? And, and God, you know, God pretty much told him, you know, where were you when I created everything? Where were you, et cetera, and et cetera. Now, God did not owe him an answer. Job did not understand what was going on, but God did. You can read about the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk, that's just fun to say. The prophet Habakkuk, um, he lived in a horrible time full of brutality and violence, and, and he was wondering why God was letting the Chaldeans uh, get away with the things that they were doing. And he was confused, and he's like, God, why? And that reminds me of us. I mean, if you read the newspaper, you watch... If, if you watch the news or something and you, and you see the corruption and violence and horrible things going on and, and you go, God, why, right? You, why, why is this happening? Why does it have to be like this? We're like Habakkuk. We don't understand. Uh, think about John the Baptist. John the Baptist, uh, Jesus said, there's never been anybody greater born of woman. Last I checked, that's the only way you get here. And there's never, there's never been a man, a greater man born of woman than John the Baptist. Right, this great man of God, this prophet of God. He, he, he baptized the Lord, our Lord and Savior Jesus, this great man of God. And, and Herod takes him and throws him in prison. And while he's in this pr prison, look, the very guy who said, Behold, he told the side, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This guy, he gets in prison and he's in there for a little while and he starts to have some doubts. He's, he's like, oh, is this really? And he sent some messengers to Jesus said, hey, are you really the one that we've been waiting on or should we wait for another? Why? Because John got confused. He didn't understand what was going on and he was asking for an answer. I think about the Apostle Paul. He wrote more books of the New Testament than anybody else. But if you read those letters to the Corinthians, you come to this spot where he says, we're confused. He says, I, I, the Apostle Paul was saying, I don't understand everything that's happening. Paul was confused. Now, if Job, Habakkuk, John the Baptist, and the Apostle Paul, and you and, and I, we reach this place where, where you know, we just don't understand, and it's going to happen to all of us sooner or later. Our lives are not going to make sense. We're not going to be where we thought we would be. We're not going to be doing what we thought we would be doing. Uh, our, our lives aren't going to unfold the way that we envisioned them. And if you think it's always going to make sense, that you're always going to know the answers, you're going to have a life full of spiritual confusion and disappointments. As a matter of fact, in, that, in this verse, it says, Who among you, who among you fears the Lord, listening to the voice of his servant? Who among you walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of Yahweh. Let him lean on his God. When it, this is telling us, listen, Darkness can never put out light. If there's no light, if you don't understand, there's a reason. It's only because the light has been withdrawn. And if you're in darkness, it doesn't mean that the devil is one. Now, do you think that Satan thought he won when Joseph was in prison? Yes, but it doesn't mean that the devil is one. Listen, if God takes away some light from you, if he puts you in a situation, it's, you're in darkness and you don't understand, you're going to have to trust the fact that at least, at the very least, God allowed it. 
At the very least, God allowed it, and there's a reason. There's a purpose. There's a, a plan. He's working it for good. There are simply some things that we are not meant to understand. Joseph, I promise, did not understand what God was up to in his life. And as a matter of fact, uh, as you go through his life story and you come to the end uh, uh, in this section in about chapter 50, you see it's revealed that God is working out a plan, a wonderful mosaic, this beautiful plan out of Joseph's life. But I promise when he was in the prison, he did not understand. Look what the Bible says in Isaiah 55, verses 8. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. Look at verse 9. It says, For as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. How far is up? <laughs> Can you tell me? How, how much further are God's ways than our ways? How much higher are God's thoughts than our thoughts? It says, For as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Just because it doesn't make sense to me doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense. Listen, and just because it doesn't make sense right now doesn't mean it's, going, it's not going to make sense someday. Someday it will make sense. I got this out of a poem. It says, not now, but in the coming years. It may be in the better land. We'll understand the meaning of our tears, and there we will understand. Someday we will understand all. But listen, the first principle I want to get from Joseph's story here is, listen, when you don't demand to understand when life doesn't make sense, try to understand. Try to learn and grow, but don't demand. And number two, write this down. This is the second one. Don't fail to be faithful. Don't demand to understand, and don't fail to be faithful. Look at Genesis chapter 39, verses 21 and 22. I love this. It says, But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. He granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. The warden put all the prisoners who were in the prison under Joseph's authority, and he was responsible for everything that was done there. And here's this man for no seeming re reason. I mean, like I said, he was actually doing good. He's put into prison, and instead of sitting there and sulking and pouting and woe is me, he's doing what Joseph always did. He's trusting in God, and, and he's being faithful, very faithful. He's serving the Lord there in prison. He's a man of integrity. He's a man of industry. He's a man that's there in prison in a time of darkness and persecution and everything. Listen, maybe you're here this morning and you thought everything went wrong for you in getting ready to go to church. You're not sitting in some dark Egyptian prison cell, okay? Everything was going wrong for Joseph. And he didn't pout. He didn't sulk. He served God right there where he was. The point is this. Even when Joseph could not understand, he, he wasn't what, what you would call a fair-weather Christian. He wasn't just praising God and believing in God when things were going good. Now, Joseph, there's no hint that he ever even got angry at God during any of these things. And I see, look, I've seen it so many times growing up uh, as a kid in church and even as an adult that you'll have these faithful members, these church members. I mean, maybe some of the most faithful members in the church. I mean, they're just serving God. I mean, they're, they sing in the choir and they tithe, they witness, they're faithful, they're happy, they're joyful, but let the hard times come. Not just, I mean like really, really hard times. Let, let a loved one pass away. Let somebody pass away. Let somebody get really sick, really sick. And I've seen this in my life. And many times things for them just don't make sense. So what do they do? They drop out. They quit serving. They fold up. Don't do it. That's never the answer. Even when it doesn't make sense, continue to serve the Lord. Keep singing, keep praying, keep giving, keep witnessing, keep submitting yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I promise you there are people in our church here this morning that could testify to what I'm saying. Keep submitting to Jesus. Joseph did, and the Bible says that God was with him, that God was with him. It's, it's funny, if you go back and read, and when he gets to Potiphar's house, it says, and God was with him. And then when Joseph goes to prison, it says what? And God was with him. When things were going good, God was with him. When things were going bad, God was with Joseph. Listen, God is with you this morning. If you've got Jesus as your Lord and Savior, God is with you, even when things don't make sense, especially when things don't make sense. God is with you. 
So listen, don't fail to be faithful. Don't demand to understand. Don't fail to be faithful. And number three, don't bow to bitterness. Write that down. Don't bow to bitterness. Don't get bitter. Oh, it's so easy, isn't it? To get bitter and angry and and just twist it up inside. But look at Genesis chapter 40, verse 14. Now listen, Joseph, uh, he's talking to the, the butler or the, the cup bearer, whatever uh, title you want to give him, but this butler's been in prison. Joseph knows uh, that this butler is about to get out of prison and that because he's this chief cup bearer that he's going to be in the presence of Pharaoh. And, and Joseph's basically saying, hey, when you see Pharaoh, remember me. Joseph, I've been good to you while you've been here. Listen, remember me. Tell the Pharaoh that I'm here. Remember, look at these verses, starting in verse 14. He says, but when all goes well for you, Remember that I was with you. Please show kindness to me by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. For I was kidnapped from the land of Hebrews, of the Hebrews. And even here I have done nothing wrong that I should I have done nothing that they should put me in the dungeon. I've done nothing. He's saying, remember me. Think about me. He said, I was sold as a slave. Now I'm in a dungeon. I've done nothing wrong. Listen. Chief Cupbearer, Butler, when, when you get back to the Pharaoh, remember me. Say, say a good word for me because I, I want out of here. I don't, I don't want to be here. And, and as I read this, I think about Joseph's spirit, and I'm pretty amazed because I am absolutely convinced that there's not a hint of bitterness in Joseph. He's not mad. You know how I know how I'm convinced of it? There's no details. He doesn't say, my brother's. My brothers, it was Reuben and the rest of them rascals. They threw me in the pit, and then I ended up getting sold here. He doesn't mention names. He doesn't say Potiphar didn't believe me after I was so good to him. right? His wife was wanting wanting me, and I turned her down, and here I am. right? He doesn't mention names. What do we do when we get bitter? Oh, we tell it all. It was so-and-so down there on the third shift supervisor. That rascal, he lives down such and such road. You know, the blue house with the white pickup truck. That rascal wrote me up. And I wasn't doing nothing wrong. He takes smoke breaks too. He can't say nothing. What are we, isn't that what we do? Everybody do like this. We give details. We, we tell them how old they are, what color kind of hair they have, or lack thereof. And we just, we just tell them. Every little, but Joseph here, he says, look, I was kidnapped and I've done nothing and I'm in jail. Help me out. He, he's not blaming individuals. He knows that God's in control. When things go wrong, when you're serving God and you're punished for doing good, don't get bitter. Remember this verse, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. It says, for what credit is there if you sin and are punished and you endure it? But when you do what is good and suffer, if you endure it, this brings favor with God. This is a wonderful verse. This describes Joseph's life to a T right here. This is Joseph's life summed up in a verse. And we need to be careful about this matter of bitterness. Listen, you're, you're going to find yourself not only dropping out when things don't make sense, but if you're not careful, that, that root of bitterness is going to settle in your heart, and it's an ugly thing. And let me just, as a side note, in case you don't know, people don't like bitter people. Let me say that again. People don't like bitter people. If you're a bitter person and you've never got anything good to say, people aren't glad when they see you coming. That's not that's just good everyday advice, amen? You should just know that. If you let your heart get bitter, bitter and twisted and gnawed up in anger and resentment, it's not just going to affect you, it's going to affect the people you care about and, and other people that you know. One of the greatest tests in life is this. It's this verse. It's not when you get punished for doing wrong, it's when you get persecuted for doing what's right. How do you react when that happens says, says a lot about you. See, Joseph, again, he has done right. He's not, and even though he's done right, done nothing wrong, he's actually been punished for doing something right. There's not a shred, a hint, a, 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 anything, just a sign of bitterness in his life at all. It simply is not there. Why? Because God was with him. And one of the reasons that God was with him is because of the attitude that he, he had. Look at number four. Don't just, also don't, don't be bitter, but also don't be unwilling to wait. Don't be unwilling to wait. When you don't understand, when life doesn't make sense, don't be unwilling to wait. God will bring you out in his time. Look at verse 23 of chapter 40. It says, yet the chief, chief cupbearer, this butler, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. 
sounds like the people we know. Amen. I mean, just he forgot them, right? And and, and I here's Joseph just year after year after year. Joseph said, when you get there, please remember me. I haven't done anything wrong. If you could say a good word, that'd be great. This guy gets out of prison. He don't even remember Joseph, right? He is, he's done. But Joseph has been here suffering in prison year after year. But God, look at this, verse uh, 46, chapter 41, verse 46. It says, Joseph was 30 years old. Let's, right there. He was 30 now when, he, when he's getting out, when he entered the service of Pharaoh and all that. He's 30. When he got sold into slavery, Joseph was 17 years old. Okay? So all these years have passed. I don't think he was in Potiphar's house, you know, 12 years and he was only in prison for one, okay? He's in prison for a long time. Year after year after year after year. Don't be unwilling to wait. All this time, this boy who had been sold into slavery, 17 years old, he's waiting on God. So when you don't understand, don't get in a hurry. Don't get hasty. Don't make a mistake that you're going to regret later. Look at Psalm 37, verse 5 through 9. This is a wonderful passage of Scripture. Look, circle this bad boy. When you go home this afternoon, after lunch, you take a nap, you wake up. Look at this verse. Amen? Verse 5, it says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will act, making your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like the noonday. Be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for Him. Do not be agitated by one who prospers in his way, by the man who carries out evil plans. Refrain from anger and give up your rage. Do not be agitated. It can only bring harm. For evildoers will be destroyed, but those who put their hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Wait on God when things don't seem to be making sense. When you wait. I heard a preacher one time. He was in a very difficult church. And, you know, I mean, he was just in a hard spot in the church. You know, he was just, oh, and he was like, and he, he shared with some other preachers, and he said, well, I know that God put me here, but I wonder sometimes if he remembers where. Amen? Sometimes you're going to be in a situation that God's put you in, and you're going to begin to think, does God remember me? Does he know that I'm here? God knows what you're going through. And, and listen, God, the God that was with Joseph in Potiphar's house, the God that was with Joseph in the prison, and the God that was with Joseph when he got out of prison is with you this morning. Look at this, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. It says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you at the proper time. You can't hurry God. God, Listen, I don't know if you know this. God has a schedule. God has a plan. And listen, when, when, don't demand to understand. Don't bow to bitterness. Don't do all of these things. But you can't be unwilling to wait. Listen, God is never late. Okay, please listen. God is never late, but he's never early. God is never late. But he is never, ever early. You can't rush him. In that verse that we read just a moment ago, it said, uh, uh, making your righteousness shine like the dawn. Listen, God's will is like this. It's like the sunrise in the morning. Sometimes it seems like it takes forever, doesn't it? You ever watch a sunrise? It seems like it's just going, it's taking forever. There's nothing that you can do to rush it, but there's nothing you can do to stop it. That's God's will in your life. Sometimes when you're going through something, and God's placed you there for a reason, there's nothing you can do to rush your way out of it, right? And there's nothing you can do to stop it. God's will will be done in your life, and he loves you, and he's with you. He has his own schedule. Uh, I don't know if you know this name, Alexander Soshinskin. He was a Russian dissident. He was a, a, a writer, and he was a man of God, a great man of God. He won the uh, Nobel Prize for literature. He's this brilliant godly man. He, he came up during this uh, time of communism in Russia and this oppression, and he's put into a prisoner camp. And he's in this work camp, and in this camp, uh, they would do this back-breaking labor. They would, I mean, from dawn to dusk, and, and there's always these Russian soldiers, machine guns. They'd shoot anybody that tried to run off, and uh, they weren't allowed to speak to each other, ever. Like these guys, all these prisoners, they were never allowed to speak. Right? If they spoke to each other, they'd get beat down. And, and so he's there, and he starts getting depressed, and his mind starts getting twisted, and he's, he's not worth it. I'm just going to kill myself. And then, But he was a Christian. He said, I can't kill myself. Oh, that's wrong. And, but his mind had gotten to such a point, he goes, I know what. I'll pretend like I'm trying to escape. I'll jump up and run. They'll shoot me in the back. They killed me, so I'm not killing myself. It, it's a win-win, right? And he said, you know, he even figured out which day he was going to do it. And they're in the middle of their back-breaking labor, whatever that was, and, and they actually got a couple-minute break. And, and they went and they um, 
he uh, was sitting under a tree, and he's looking. There's the guard with the machine gun, and he says, now's the time. And he put his hands uh, under his rear, and he's just about to spring up and take off running. He's already putting pressure down. And this man, this other prisoner, he says he's never seen him before. Matter of fact, he even said it could have been an angel. I don't know. He said, this man came and stood in front of me. He said, look me right in the eyes. And he said, he looked at me with so much compassion and love and understanding. It just kind of, I'm like, you know. And then the guy had a stick in his hand, and he drew a cross in the dirt. And then he just walked away. And then Alexander took that. He said, this is God telling me not to kill myself, right? But he said what drove him to that was, in his mind, he began to think, nobody cares that I'm here. Nobody, does anybody even know where I'm at? Nobody cares. I, I don't matter. I'm not important. God is not taking care of me. It'd be better if things were just over. And he was about to take his life. Three days after this happened, he was a free man in Switzerland. Because millions of people around the world were pressuring the Russian government to let him go. Millions of Christians around the world were praying for him. He didn't even know it. He thought he'd been forgotten, that he'd been abandoned, and he was just a hair's breadth away from taking his life, and God worked it out so that he wouldn't. Listen, don't fail to wait on God. Wait on God. He has his time. He, ha he has a plan for your life. Humble yourself. I love that phrase. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And in due time, He will lift you up. Number five, last thing. Don't let dreams dissolve. Write that down. Don't let dreams dissolve. Joseph had a dream. And that dream was put in his heart as a very young man uh, by God. And the dream was that one day the, all the world's resources and the rulers were going, were going to be at his feet, right? And his brothers thought it was a foolish dream and, and, and all, all, all this going on. But God had given him this dream. Now, I'm going to skip a lot of material, but just recognize this. At this point where we're going right now, Joseph has been, uh, he's out of prison. He's about to be exalted and he's about to become the prime minister of Egypt. God had not forgotten Joseph in the dungeon. Look at verses 37 through 44. It says, the proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find anyone like this, a man who has God's spirit in him? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one as intelligent and wise as you are. You will be over my house and all my people will obey your commands. Only with regard to the throne will I be greater than you. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, see, I am placing you over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. He clothed him with fine linen garments and placed a gold chain around his neck. He had Joseph ride in his second chariot, and servants called out before him, A breck. So he placed over him, oh, him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but no one will be able to raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt without your permission. See, and this is the fulfillment of the very dream that Joseph had when he was a child. Joseph never forgot it, and God never forgot it. I don't know who first said this, but it was a wise man. He says, he says don't doubt in the dark what God has shown you in the light. Don't doubt in the dark. Don't doubt in the hard times what God has shown you in the light. God did not fail Joseph. Listen, let me tell you something. God will not fail you. Listen, he did not fail Joseph, and God will not fail you if you're trusting him. Don't let your uh, dreams dissolve. I mean, look at this for a second, though. No longer, no, no longer does he have a, a prisoner's hand. Now he's got the Pharaoh's ring on his finger. No longer is Joseph wearing those nasty rags from prison. Now he's dressed in the finest clothes in all the land. No longer is he shackled by chains in prison. Now he's got a gold chain around his neck. God is faithful. Joseph's God is our God. And you know what Pharaoh said? Listen, think about this for a minute. Uh, listen, Joseph said, listen, I mean, the Pharaoh said, you are going to be in charge. Nobody's going to do nothing without your consent. You're going to be over everything, everything. You're in charge of everything. You remember it was Potiphar. If you remember, if you read closely, Potiphar was in charge of the Egyptian guard, right? So I am just imagine Potiphar being there when all this happens. Right? And so Potiphar comes home after work, you know. And, and, and now Joseph rides out from the palace. He's got, like, people yelling, a break, a break. You know, kneel down, kneel down, get out of the way. Right? And so Potiphar goes home for, for supper with Mama Neil. And, and so there he is, and there's his wife, Potiphar's wife. And, 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 you know, he says, you know, do you remember 
several years ago, we had this servant boy, and, and you said he tried to molest you, and I threw him in prison. <laughs> you remember that? And then she's like, I think, yeah, I, yes, I remember that, you know. And he says, well, I hope you're telling the truth because I report to him tomorrow. Amen. Think about that. God had so exalted Joseph. And there's going to come a day in your life, if you're going through hard times right now, that God is going to make things right. Don't lose your faith when it doesn't make sense. Again, because it doesn't make sense to you now doesn't mean it won't make sense someday. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense to God. Serve Jesus. Never quit. Give Him your heart. Give Him your life. And don't ever, 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 ever lose the dream that God gave you. Maybe, you, you know, maybe you're here this morning and you're like, I don't have a dream. Listen, the Bible says that our old men will dream, have dreams. If you don't have a dream, get one. Listen, it's always too early to quit. It's never too late to start. It's always too early to quit. It's never too late to start. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes, please? Every head bowed, every eye closed. You need to know Jesus because Jesus is the key to this entire story. In the Old Testament, those saints looked forward to the coming Messiah. Today, we look backward to the Messiah who came, and all of us look upward to the Jesus of the Bible. Would you like to be saved this morning? You can be saved. You can simply just pray this prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed, just pray this prayer. Just say, Dear God, I'm a sinner. And my sin deserves judgment, but I want mercy. God, I do not want to die and go to hell. I want to be saved. Jesus, you died to save me. You promised to save me if I trusted you. I do. I, I trust you now. Come into my heart. Forgive me. Save me, Jesus. All right. Did you pray that this morning? Have you ever prayed that? It's not too late. It's always too early to quit. It's never too late to start. Just pray it. Say, Jesus, save me. Did you ask him this morning? If you did, if you, by faith, you've asked Jesus Christ to save you, to be your Lord and Savior, to be God of your life, Lord of your life, so that he can be with you like he was with Joseph. Thank him. Say, thank you. I receive it by faith, God. I, I'm not looking for a feeling. I'm, not, I'm trusting in your word. I'm standing on your word. And just ask God, God, begin to make me the person that you want me to be. God, give me the courage to make this public. God, I'm not ashamed of you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't know what you need to do this morning, what business you need to do with God this morning. Uh, maybe you saw the example of our baptisms this morning and, and you feel in your heart that you need to be follow Jesus in scriptural baptism as we see it. Maybe God's calling you to officially join this church, become a member of this fellowship. Maybe it's something else. Maybe you just need to come to the altar this morning and not to demand to understand, but ask God to give you light in the darkness. Whatever you need this morning, come and do it this morning. Father God, we give this invitation to you. We love you and we trust you. Give us the courage to do what's right. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.